Welcome back to week nine of Square Scare and Prayer segment. To give you a refresher, our Square players, some inners have their doubts, but you must start them. Our Scare players, consider your options because you might want to bench them. And our Prayer players, it's a guy on your bench ranked outside the start line for the position this week that you should be considering starting, or maybe a fire you could pick up off the waiver wire to give you a quick refresher of that criteria for that start line for squares. Uh, they must finish inside the top 36 wide receivers, 24 running backs, top 12 tight ends or quarterbacks. Scares are outside those marks. Prayers are inside those marks. I'm joined by my colleague, Timmy, at Nubs on Twitter. My good friend here, Tim. You ready to get into it with your square for the week? Let's get into, get into it. <laughs> my, my square for the week is actually going to be Josh Palmer. I really like what we're seeing with him coming back from, from injury. He has produced when he gets eight or more targets. It's 13 or more points, like, immediately. Um, with Mike Williams and Keenan out, and facing Atlanta's defense, which is basically last in like every pad- passing category except for touchdowns, which they're twenty sixth in. I really like what I'm seeing um, from the the capabilities that Palmer is going to have this week. He's also something interesting is he's ninth in the league in target separation this year, um, cumulative versus man in zone. So he does get open, and he's going to create a lot of open windows for Herbert to attack. Um, and I do like their chances at scoring a lot of points this week because they don't really defend well against the run. And Atlanta is going to have to really um, lay that run attack on hard, especially in the red zone. Marcus doesn't throw very much in the red zone. He's I'm actually going to be talking about that a little bit later, but he's only had 31 attempts within the 20 all season, which is just extremely low. So I think they're going to attack on the ground. Atlanta is, which is going to probably score some, decent amount of points which is going to force the chargers to have to respond yeah i mean you have a classic matchup here where it's one of the worst rush defenses versus one of the worst pass actually the worst passing defense uh so it is a very interesting matchup atlanta is actually they're, they're kings of the uh of covering the spread this season you know best in the nfl against the spread you know this is a line that surprise might surprise you on the surface i think it was like a three-point line when it came out uh atlanta is going to play this game a little closer and with with the chargers having none of their go-to options uh herbert's probably going to find himself in a position where he has to utilize the guys he's comfortable with the guys he knows and so where palmer might not have the biggest day i think he's almost a lock for that top 36 same where i would say with gerald ever at top 12 for tight ends where you know those two guys who've been involved all season i think they're going to be featured in the game plan and in tight spots where herbert really needs a go-to he's going to be going to those guys because it's this game could end up being a lot closer than maybe uh the casual viewer would expect and you know that that could actually play well for palmer and his involvement and I think Palmer is actually a much better receiver than people give him credit for. The problem is that he's behind Mike Williams and he's behind Keenan, but he's very uh, capable of handling <clears throat> targets outside, battling his cornerback, winning matchups against his cornerback. And once again, he's just not really going to be going up against very good cornerbacks in this game. Absolutely. So we're going to move on here. My square player for the week is going to be uh, somebody that people kind of counted out in the preseason. But he's emerged as a guy I've been comfortable with starting as my RB2 every single week. Uh, it's going to be Miami back Raheem Mostert. Now, Mostert finds himself in a familiar room after Chase Edmonds' exit with McDaniel bringing in Jeff Wilson Jr. But it's my expectation Mostert will remain the lead back. Uh, you know, However, having some true relief might actually help him and keep him a little fresh. I think he was looking like he had a little bit of tired legs, and uh, Chase Edmonds was just running terribly he was he was he was losing touches to gaskin salvin Ahmed, you know in his last few weeks uh but most are, he's re, he's remained an efficient runner all year you know he found himself outside the top 24 last week due to no touchdown limited receiving work uh maybe a game that was a little closer than people would have expected and you know that might have put people off most for this week but in a matchup versus chicago who's allowed nine rushing touchdowns in eight games uh, i think most finds himself in a prime spot to bounce back uh like miami's odds to get in in the in the to the head zone on the ground this week and if they're going to do that uh most is probably the best candidate to do so chicago also they allow the eighth most points of running backs and with jeff wilson jr potentially needing a week you know to acclimate firing up Raheem most where i can clear top 24 option in my opinion yeah i like most um especially when he you know i don't think we've ever doubted his ability to to produce points it's just to, to stay healthy and he's proven so far that he's uh able to still bust up the long runs and um, I do like this this play this week for sure. Yeah. So 
We're going to go on here to our little accountability segment like we always do. We were 5-1 last week on our picks. That puts us at 34-12 and 12 in the season. That's 74%. Uh, both Tim and I are right at 74% as well um, individually. So we hit on Christian Kirk, Donovan People jones David Montgomery, Tony Power, Adam Thielen all last week. Our miss was Wandell Robinson. Perhaps I jumped the gun on Wandell. Uh, I wouldn't be dropping him. But I like when you just need to see another week post by before I feel comfortable flexing in a typical lineup. Uh, I don't really have too much to say. Uh, you know, Daniel Jones' offense, we brought up how it's only going to get 200 yards, give or take, each game. It's really just about the targets. He only saw four last week, which was surprising. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to monitor that usage moving forward. Um, but we're going to, we'll, we'll roll right into our scares for the week, Tim. So who you got? I'm going with Michael Pittman this week, and I didn't really feel too strongly about a lot of the scares this week. But for the information that I or the information I can purvey, I feel like Pittman is someone just to consider going somewhere else. I understand there's still an argument against the Patriots that they may not be as strong as they are. They have been perceived all season and there could be garbage time work. But with that built in, Ellinger last week had 200 yards, no touchdowns, uh, no interceptions, played decent. Now, the only – let me ask you a question real quick. Who do you think the only QB against the Patriots this year was to put up 300 yards? Passing? Who, was the, who was the only one? Yeah. Um, not sure. I'm, I don't want to say Zach Wilson, was it? It was Zach Wilson. It was Zach, Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson was the first quarterback all season to, to eclipse the 300-yard mark. And a lot of that was in garbage time after the game was basically already decided because he had so many turnovers. So just a little bit of a comparison. Trubisky had 200, or 166 yards. Aaron Rodgers had 251. Fields has 179. So I'm not really expecting Ellinger to go out and throw for 300 yards. Maybe in garbage time, but that's not something I'm going to be expecting to occur very often. As well as what we're seeing is with Pittman, the last uh, basically last like six weeks, he's only had one truly big game, and a lot of it um, – Besides that, it's been five of the last seven weeks he's been under 75 yards, and four of the last seven weeks he's been under 60 yards. So you're really hoping for volume um, in the receptions as well as then hoping that there's enough yards to complement those receptions, and I'm not sure we're going to be seeing that. Um, like I said, it could be a garbage time situation, but I'm just I'm not expecting that. Patriots are averaging 224 yards given up per game through the air, so I don't see him going over that. And I understand that there are situations that you're probably just going to have to play them with the buys. But if there's a situation in which you do have a deep wide receiver room, he's probably someone I'm going to try to avoid. Yeah, it might seem bold on the surface, but since his big week one, uh, the one big week that you alluded to week six against Jacksonville, I mean, he's had 16 targets in that game, which is how he came up with 130 yards. But Week one, we got so excited, you know, over nine yards per target, over 13 yards per uh, reception. He had a touchdown. Since then, it's been nothing reminiscent of that. I mean, the last two weeks, uh, he's been around six yards per target. That's that's tough. I mean, so he had nine targets with Sam Ellinger last week. But if you're only going to get the ball, you know, six yards per target, seven and a half yards per catch, it's going to take a lot for you to get there or a score. So. Um, it is really disappointing. We were hoping for a big Michael Pittman year. Um, the rest of the season, obviously, he's someone you're going to be considering each week, but it's not looking as good as we thought it was going to. And he's only had that one touchdown since week one, so it's not like he's supplementing his lack of yardage with a touchdown to give you you know, a larger, larger score at the end of the week. So that's just something to consider. And like I said, 166 yards from Trubisci, 179 from Fields. I feel like that's more resembling of what what we could see from Ellinger unless there's just massive amounts of garbage time, which I don't expect, especially if the Patriots can play their ball game, which would be uh, running the ball as well as I wanted to come, uh, say as well. I think be, the only reason that Wilson had over 300 yards was because the jets couldn't run the ball at all. So they basically became one facet, one phase of the offense and they just had to lean on it and it didn't work. Yeah. I mean, he could, he could add up with a third of, um, you know, the targets and that could still only end up being, you know, eight or nine for 60 yards and that's your week. Mm -hmm. All right. So my scare for this week is going to be Devin Singletary. You know, earlier in the year, I was actually surprised to see Devin Singletary top the league in routes run. Um, 
but once it was clear that Buffalo was, you know, wavering their confidence in rookie James Cook, uh, Singletary became a pretty viable weekly option due to his routes. I know a lot of a lot of uh, you know people were starting to really like Devin Singletary. You know, wide on the channel was a big fan of Devin Singletary. But the problem I have with Motor is that he only has four rushes inside the ten yard line all season. Uh, a 54% decline in targets over his last three games versus the three prior, an inconsistent snap count despite similar game scripts, and Buffalo has now brought in Naeem Hines, who's a back who specializes in everything that Singletary does not do well, namely running routes and catching footballs. You know, 58% of Singletary's points this season have come from his receiving work that he's likely going to lose to Naeem Hines. So this outlook doesn't put Singletary above backs like Isaiah Pacheco, in my eyes, moving forward, somebody who could, you know, he's an effective runner, an efficient runner. He's going to run well, but he's not somebody that I'm going to count on any consistency week to week or have any confidence putting in my lineups. Uh, I expect the Bills to win pretty handedly versus the Jets, but without receiving work or a TD, it's hard for me to squeeze Devin Singletary as a top 24 option, and he's RB18 in consensus on the week. Uh, I prefer backs like AJ Dillon, Raheem Moster, Deonta Foreman, Antonio Gibson, Tower Algier, Jamal Williams, and Khalil Herbert. I prefer all of those names over uh, Devin Singletary for this week. We are on the same page. I, I debated using Singletary in, as my scare. Um, I, for all the reason you, you said, as well as even if you look at last week, he was very productive early. Bills got up, decided that they wanted to uh, protect him as much as possible because he was running really well. And the faucet kind of shut off, which actually kind of changed what his average was for the rest of the game in terms of yards per carry after uh, the first couple drives because it seemed like the Bills kind of just condensed their offense a little bit. But I'm with you. I think uh, I think Hines Hines can come in pretty quickly. There's not going to be too much of an adjustment because of the fact that his role really doesn't change and he's good at his role. So I, I think he's done the work and there won't be an issue bringing him in and having him play a decent amount. Yeah, I think Singletary is much more important for them in real football and what they want to do. And they have games, namely against the Chiefs, where they want to just establish a little bit of the run, hard runs, good runs. Singletary is that first, second down grind who can come in and give you, you know, a good four, five, six yards per carry, um, you know, which can help mix up the pace of the game. But I can't see that being fantasy relevant. And, you know, there is a disconnect between real football and fantasy. That's how I feel about Naeem Hines as well, where... It's going to be hard for me to trust him for fantasy, you know, even coming into Buffalo. He is a little lightning bolt in the red zone, which is something they can use. He, he He's a good third down back, which is something they can use. But it's just hard for me to be able to predict the consistency with either one of these backs or James Cook or whoever's involved there, especially knowing, you know, the real lead back is Josh Allen. And that's how teams come and address and respect their backfield is they're, they're looking at containing Allen first before, you know, which can help these guys in their efficiency, but with limited touches, I'm just staying away from all of them. hundred percent. I think Heinz actually might have the better upside between the two. If you're looking for fantasy score wise, but neither one of them are going to be predictable and neither one of them are going to be someone that you can, you can count on either the volume or the yardage every week. For me, Naeem Hines is nothing more than a prayer play. You're going to have bye weeks, maybe an injury, and you're like, crap, who can I slide in at running back? Your options have to be pretty bleak for me to put a lot of faith in Naeem Hines. So, all right, Tim, what's your prayer for week nine? Okay, I, I uh, alluded to a little bit of Marcus Mariota talk to begin with, but I'm actually going to go with the running back, Tyler Algier, in this game because uh, over the last four games, he's been, been hovering around the 60% uh, snap share mark. And the first two games he had were against very good run defenses, San Francisco and um, Tampa Bay, and he didn't lose. He actually gained more snap share after those games. So I think that the coaching staff shows that they have faith in him. And Atlanta is very, very, very dependent on the run game inside the red zone, like I had alluded to earlier. And I'm just going to give you a few numbers. So Marcus had 30, has 31 passes inside the red zone this year, 31 attempts. Just to compare, guys that we kind of think are safe and um, don't don't like to take risks inside the red zone, or they're very just very safe. Cousins has 74 attempts. Matt Ryan has 56 attempts, and that team hasn't even been really in the red zone that much. Compared to like a Herbert, who has, I believe, 72, or um, Mahomes, who I think has 85. 
So it's nowhere near the passing volume that you want inside the red zone. So you know they're leaning on that. They have a lot of read option plays that they like to run inside the red zone. And I think a lot of that's going to go towards Algier, especially when they get to the goal line. So I am expecting a rushing touchdown. Um, we obviously know that the Chargers are trending as a really poor run defense. Statistically, they're not as bad as, as if you were to, to look based on your expectations at the comparisons to the other teams. They're not as bad as you would expect but they are trending in that negative or really poor direction, especially when you look back even at like a Kenneth Walker week where he even catch passes. And I think he put up like close to 30 points. I'm not expecting 30 from, from Algier, but I'm expecting something pretty decent. Um, they're also, so Marcus just in comparison, that's 25th in the league in terms of attempts inside the red zone, which is very low. So they're, like I said, they're going to be leaning on Algier and I, I just think that this is the the way I'm going to lean on this rushing attack this week. Yeah, I mean, you have two teams here who are both bottom five in the league and touchdowns allowed per game. So both teams are going to have some chances to score. Uh, and if Alona is going to do it, just like you said, you know, it's it's it hasn't been through the air so far this year. Um, and Algier right now is leading the way on the ground. He's been incredibly inefficient. Uh, it's a little note I want to say if, you know, Cordell Patterson, if for some reason is available on your waiver wire, uh, he might be back next week, which is er a little earlier than we were expecting. And that's a player who could come in and really make a difference, uh, you know, assuming he comes back even half speed just because of how inefficient Huntley and Algier have been on the ground. Uh, it was nice to see Algier get a couple of receptions last week. That'll really prop up a nice day. Uh, that could always happen, especially if they get a little behind in this game. So that is always something that could help prop it up if he doesn't get that touchdown. Uh, but he has scored both of the last two weeks, uh, and he's, you know, he's had over fifty, he's had over fourteen or more carries three weeks in a row. So if he's going to do it again, um, you know, I'd probably say it's a good coin flip that he does score a touchdown. He got to the corner a couple times against Carolina, which I really liked, as well as Huntley's really not eating in the snap share very much. He's, <clears throat> I think, averaging close to twenty at best, and. Like I said, Algiers around 60, and I think they could even be higher this week. Okay. So my prayer for the week, our last player on the day, is going to be Trevor Lawrence. So only six teams have allowed greater than 20 points per game against opposing quarterbacks, and Vegas is the worst of that bunch. So my prayer, Trevor Lawrence... Uh, I think he's, he's he's just in for a very big day against a terrible defense. Uh, after finishing his quarterback four and quarterback seven back to back, uh, he hit a roadblock in Denver. Good news is everyone hits a roadblock in Denver. Um, you know he's only been running the ball actually a little over three times per game this season, which has surprised me. But a week six and seven, while phasing out, you know James Robinson, Trevor punched in three rushing touchdowns with James Robinson completely out of the picture. Um, you know having be, being moved to the Jets. Uh, I think Lawrence does have elevated odds to help the team score using his feet, which is always could be a nice little boost to give you a floor, um, you know, and get him into that top 12. Additionally, you know, Lawrence is averaging 230 passing yards per game, but he's only been below that mark on three occasions. And all three of those games he threw for less than 150 in losing efforts. So I think his average is a little skewed at this point. So when Lawrence throws the ball over 30 times, he's more than likely to give you a 250 plus receiving yard day, which is something that's very important as well for getting into that top 12. Uh, he's been inefficient in scoring positions, which is what has hurted him here. Like if he's getting, you know, 250 plus yards uh, in the air, how is he not being close to top 12 every single week? It's been their inefficiency in the red zone, but you know, Vegas is a team that allows a lot of passing yards, a lot of passing touchdowns, both above a league average rate uh so with that i think it's, it's just a good matchup for trevor lawrence to, to get it done this week finish the top 12 option uh he's a top streamer for me in week nine very very content putting him in lineups in redraft trevor lawrence is a guy you definitely want to grab if you can this week and i want I'm, obviously i agree with starting him but i think this is the start of a stretch in which you're going to be able to play him besides his bye week which is coming up because they're going to be passing defenses that allow points as well as offensive teams that are going to score points so i think he's going to be in a couple shootouts i do like him this week i'm very surprised that vegas isn't better than what we're what they are now based on the preseason expectations and how they performed last year their defense is actually pretty decent but they haven't performed well they were terrible last week the offense was terrible last week so they probably have something to prove this week to put up some points which actually could help uh, in lawrence's effort to be in the qb top top 12 qbs this week yeah and I love what you said about, you know, picking them up for next week as well, because Kansas City 
is the opponent you were alluding to, and they're also one of the worst against quarterback for fantasy in a game where they might be chasing. So, well, they like- also then play play Detroit two weeks after that, or three weeks after that, excuse me, and then Tennessee, who has no no uh, cornerbacks at this point. It's true, but that might be something you'll look at after the bye week. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Well, I think that's about it. Anyone, honestly, thank you for coming being here. Any comments you have, please drop them below. If you have players you're scared of playing or people that you're really high on for the week, uh, please let us know. If you disagree with any of these takes like you always do, please <laughs> let us hear it. You can join our Discord. It'll be the top thing in the bio. You know, start sits. It honestly helps me, helps others. There's questions going there all the time. A lot of strategies have been talked this week for how to manage your rosters in the redraft chat for you know players of all variety of expert uh experience in fantasy football so it's been really really good discussions um you can find all our stuff on twitter at jwb underscore ff you can find me at the ff buffalo my partner tim at nubs two n's two b's and with that we will catch you guys next time